content warning. Violence, gore, and gross-out humor. I'm surprised more games don't take advantage of public domain characters and stories. There's so much potential for these ideas to take unique form in video games. Like imagine if there was a Frankenstein game where you play as the monster, or in other words, through the eyes of the monster. Also, let's just throw Tim Curry in there for extra flavor. Okay, you got me. The game exists already. It's called Frankenstein Through the Eyes of the Monster, and it's the subject of this story deep dive. So let's get on with it. Frankenstein Through the Eyes of the Monster is a point-and-click adventure game developed by Amazing Media and published by Interplay for PC in 1995 and Sega Saturn in 1997. This game is notable as it was Amazing Media's first attempt at an adventure game. Kind of. Their previous efforts were educational games, but from what I could find, their format was similar to what we see in Frankenstein. They taught topics such as Capitol Hill, the Space Shuttle, and Wyatt Earp's Old West. Educational. Frankenstein's major selling point was the inclusion of Tim Curry as Dr. Frankenstein, which I mean, it got me to play the game, so good choice on the developer's part. The other major point of interest is that we play as the monster in this game. But did it take advantage of these aspects to make a great adventure game? Let's start the game and find out. Where am I? What is happening to me? The game begins with audio detailing how the main character, Philip Waring, is sentenced to death for the murder of his daughter Gabrielle. Once his death is finished, we are jolted awake on an operating table with... Dr. Frankenstein standing over us? The perspective here is somewhat strange. He's alive. Alive! He injects us and himself with something and claims to have brought us back to life. We check our hands to find that they are not our own, but of two different people. There's also attempted humor in that one of the hands is from a woman. My hand. It's... Good God. It's the hand of a woman. What has this vile bastard done to me? Oh, ha ha. Frankenstein then checks some of our senses, revealing we have a difficulty talking. Can you hear me? Anything? Perhaps you can read lips. N no, no! You must be able to hear. Perhaps the cat's got your tongue. <sighs> You've no idea how close to the truth that statement is. <sighs> With this, we get up to find we are in the laboratory, and begin to search our surroundings for more clues about where we are. This is essentially where the game begins. All we could do is look at some objects and read some newspapers for more information on the plot. We learn that Philip was convicted by Judge Rothenbush of killing his daughter as well as kidnapping some children. But Philip knows he didn't do that. He's justifiably angry. Judge Rothenbush blaming me for the disappearance of children from other villages? That lying coward. The voice actor for Philip hands it up and is so melodramatic. I love it. Paired with Tim Curry, they actually can keep the same energy going throughout. The servants have set up a room for you on the lower level. Please make yourself at home. A word of caution. Though you have had a serious concussion, to say the least, if you were to fall asleep, well, it would probably be... <laughs> fatal. Of course, dying itself is not a problem, but the hemorrhaging. It could cause more damage to your brain. Unfortunately, the game doesn't really allow for them to play off each other as they don't interact directly a lot, only by a Philip responding through his thoughts. Outside of exposition, the lab contains a lot of foreshadowing for future puzzles and entrances, with only one we can make progress on right now. We could pick up the life stone, the item which supposedly brought us back to life, but the doctor catches us and tells us to put it down. Oh, yes. That is the reason you and I are having this conversation, Philip. The sole reason is because of Energy L. Well, to be specific, Energy L and the Lifestone Crystal, of course. Now, gently put it back on the shelf. Philip says we have to wait to take it. But I pick it up almost immediately afterwards, and he doesn't do anything. Strange. To get it out of the lab, we must make a parachute to throw it out the window. The puzzle is an easy one to start out on, since it requires the player to only turn right one screen for all the items you need. There's nothing left here, so we go outside to find an opening below a broken ledge. But we need to find a way to reach it. 
All there is are these cannonballs and a strange contraption. So might as well put a cannonball on there and pull the string. This knocks a moose head down, giving us a rope we can throw down to the opening. It's another quick puzzle to get the player acquainted to the game. There's just one thing I don't get. Why is this thing here? It doesn't seem to serve any purpose. It's just there to solve the puzzle. I guess he wanted to show off his moose head? It looks okay. Anyways, in the entrance we can find a secret room hidden from the doctor. Philip reveals he wants to do an experiment to see if Frankenstein's claim about energy L and the life stone bringing things back to life is true. With this, we have our first major objective, and we go deeper into the secret entrance to find a hidden door. To open it, we must first put these gears back into place, which takes little time. And now we enter the main area of the castle. From here, we are essentially free to roam the castle. That is, if the doors are unlocked. The first floor is easy enough to learn the layout of. If we enter the dining room, we can get a bag that'll let us hold items. We also find some notes that are incredibly hard for me to read because they are in cursive. I'm not good at reading cursive. Wish they could have put an option to convert it into plain text. The doctor suddenly appears. Dead tissue. The meal was quite good. Too bad you missed it. Eat what's left. The doctor makes several surprise appearances like these, giving the feeling that he's always around, watching. I'm not sure if the doctor's appearances run on a timer or depending on how much progress I've made. I think it's some kind of combination, as sometimes it would take me multiple steps to have an appearance trigger. It helps add some life to what is mostly solving puzzles and exploration at this point in the game. Get it? Add some life? Yeah, you probably did. Well, let's see what food is left. One single turkey leg. But we're not eating it. We're going to use it for our experiment. Into the bag it goes. Um, that's not very clean. You know, it's probably all greasy in there now, and it's probably got onto the notes, and I don't want to think about it anymore. So we now go upstairs, and everywhere looks the same. I really got lost for around 20 minutes on the second and third floor, because each spot looked pretty similar to the others, and almost every door is locked. And I locked mean almost locked every locked door. Lo 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 locked. It's frustrating and all because there isn't much to distinguish any parts of the second and third floors, other than the layout and the stairs to the first floor. All we can access is some notes. One reveals a character named Vladimir, who says Judge Rothenbush is a bad guy. Hmm. Please destroy this letter upon receiving it? Somebody didn't follow instructions. Tisk tisk tisk. We have nothing left to do here, so we go outside where Philip hams it up some more when he realizes he may be able to prove he's innocent. If I really am alive, and this isn't the afterlife, then maybe I could clear my name. He's also contemplating if he's truly alive. But if I were stitched together and brought back from the dead, am I truly alive? Am I in hell? Or have I been given a second chance? I must know the truth. He's not really taking this being brought back from the dead thing well. But who would? We discover the life stone at the top of a tower, which we climb up brick by brick to reach. Easy enough. We now go back near the lab to try to enter our room given to us by the doctor, but it is locked, and the door next to it is covered in frost. Next to the door are some heads and body parts connected to a battery, which we take. Depending on where you attach the cords, you could get the person to say, or the kitten to, cute, I think. Plug it into the right one and we defrost the door, but check in the desks behind us to get the key that unlocks our room door. We enter and see our cozy room, but it's as if I'm being watched. Frankenstein appears, surprised we got it to our room. He then tells us how he died, but we already knew about that, so... Yeah. In the defrosted room, we get a crowbar and see chemicals for an explosion. Potassium nitrate. Glycerin. And sulfuric acid? 
A chemical explosion waiting to occur. We now go back to the secret room to conduct our experiment. Just connect the battery to the life stone and... Uh, it's not working. It turns out you need to have the correct notes in your possession. So we travel all the way back to the lab, get the notes, and conduct the experiment. It's working, it's not working. What did I expect? Did I truly believe that a piece of food would spontaneously resurrect? I am a complete fool. It doesn't matter if I'm alive or if I'm dead. Nothing matters. I just want peace. So tired. I'm so hungry. It's over. I will not go on with this heinous nightmare. This turkey leg shall be my last, the meal of a condemned man. Me. <laughs> Can I never die? Haven't I suffered enough? I truly am in hell. Ew. So the experiment worked. It just isn't a pretty sight. So Frankenstein was telling the truth. Hey look, a grappling hook. But things get strange as we find a secret entrance in our room, revealing that the painting there has see-through eyes. We were being watched. That's not all that's here. This area connects many parts of the castle. If only we can navigate it. For a shortcut, they make it awfully hard to find where you need to go. There's so many twists and turns that its use as a shortcut is minimal. Eventually I find the way out, but then Frankenstein appears. And he isn't too happy about us snooping around with his notes. Now Philip, I admire your curious nature and applaud your industriousness, but you have meddled in affairs that do not concern you. My notes are quite confidential. If you do not return them immediately, let me simply say, that it was I who gave you life, and it is mine to take away. You'd think he'd take his notes back, but no, he just leaves us be. Next, we use the grappling hook on the rope outside to reach a window. We enter a room where we find some notes in a fireplace. If we put out the fireplace with a conveniently placed aquarium, we can access another shortcut. From here, we go to the library, where there are many, many notes to read. Well, it is a library. A place of reading. As we are exploring, we occasionally hear the doctor yelling about his notes. Now, Philip, I've grown tired of this game you're playing. I want my notes, and I want them now! If he wanted them, why didn't he take them back when he asked the first time? Either way, when he meets us again, he is done with our shenanigans. He holds us a gunpoint, ordering us how to move. Now! Turn around! Now here's an interesting design decision. We as the player have to actually follow his orders or get shot. They could have made it a cutscene, but this way it's more interactive. I just wish it wasn't so artificial. You see, since the game doesn't have free movement, but movement by screens, you get jarring sections where he's saying forward multiple times, and it's kind of humorous. It's like if every few steps he's like, Walk forward! Walk forward! Turn left! Following his directions, we end up handcuffed to the wall in a dungeon. He then whips Philip. After he leaves, we resolve to escape the castle and stop the doctor. But how are we going to get out of these cuffs? Well, it turns out one hand can get out. Did the doctor just not realize to tighten the cuffs? Then somebody lowers a key through a grate, which we unlock the cuff with. I wonder who that was. No time to think though, we must escape. Unfortunately, it looks like someone else wasn't so lucky. We go into a grate, which leads into a tunnel system. The exit leads to the garden maze. Yep, a maze. I don't like it. We wander around, find a beetle to kill a Venus flytrap, which gets us some shears to open another exit out of the maze. Pointless. This whole section serves no purpose but to pad the game out. We could have just had the exit be the next room, which is the planetarium. For this puzzle, we are presented with four locked doors, and a board with our solar system on it. To get the door we want to open, to open. 
We need to find the right pair of symbols to pick, as well as get the planet's positions in the correct order. The right pair of symbols are easy enough to figure out, but how do we figure out where the planets go? Well, around the castle, there are four plaques of the solar system on them, numbered one through four. Match the orientation of the planets with the right number and the corresponding door will open. This puzzle rewards those who already found these through normal exploration. But if you haven't found any and thus don't know of their existence, the game has just extended its length by a lot. We now enter the fourth door, the mausoleum, which searching through some documents reveals startling evidence. It turns out Philip was a student whose research was funded by the doctor. Research that the doctor used to discover energy L. <gasps> the research Philip did also led to an explosion which killed his wife, who the doctor was also in love with. There's also a news article about missing children. Hmm. Just lots of revelations coming out. I must find him. He stole everything from me. My wife. My child. My work. The doctor must pay! Now we have three doors to choose from. Which one will we go through? I'm going to pick... Door three. You just got... Yeah? Yeah? A maze. No. So we're in a wine cellar maze. And what's the point of it? Nothing. Nothing at all except for wasting our time to get to the next part of the castle. The melting room and the mines. There's not much to do in the melting room, outside of getting some notes on how to operate the machinery. We'll not go into the mines for now, so we must go back through the maze to get to the planetarium room. Somehow I get more lost than the first time. But when we go back to the garden maze, it at least drops us automatically outside the maze, so that's nice. Ooh, what's this gargoyle thing do? So we find a secret tunnel leading to a dock. Cellars, mines, docks, this castle's got everything. We put on a suit and grab a spear to go underwater. Ah, octopus. Oh. That was anticlimactic. We find a note with names of children, including Philip's daughter Gabrielle. She may still be alive, but I don't know how this note could survive underwater. And ooh, treasure, which we can't get. Aww. The secret tunnel we found also leads to the mines, which we'll now enter. There, we run into the talking severed hand. It helps to tell us where to go, so I guess it's friendly. We solve a quick puzzle to go deeper into the mines and reach an ore processing room, but the power is off. How do we turn it on? We have to push three buttons found in the mines. And yes, the mines are essentially another maze. This game just can't get enough of mazes. I wish the hand was here to guide us, but it only leads us to the dock now, which doesn't help. So do that, and we can start crushing some more. Unfortunately, you could screw up and need to restart the machine, but saving and loading can be used to avoid that. With that done, we have the crushed door in a cart, which was some levers, we used to open a door to some room with a machine in it, and then to the melting room. Here we solve a sequence puzzle to operate the machine and melt the ore. Now we transfer the ore to the newly opened room to solve another sequence puzzle this time to create another life stone. This part is much more complex, and even with the notes, it's a little hard to solve and figure out what you're supposed to do. Once the life stone is created, we send it up to the lab. Now to go find the doctor, who's behind a locked door, but we know the code through some notes we found. On the other side are some brains which we could play, what I think are their last words before dying. The last one is interesting, since I think it's Philip's wife, but it's never commented on, so I don't know. Look at him. My husband's so involved with his work. In the next room is Dr. Frankenstein. And he's in the same pose as a game cover. Just in different clothes. And we get to hear Philip speak out loud for the first time. You destroyed my life! Still as hammy as ever. We show him the proof of all his misdeeds against us, and he walks away in anger. Here we see his experiments gone wrong. thing. We also get some notes on how to do full body resurrections. We are about to leave the room, but the doctor appears behind us at gunpoint. He really likes doing that. And I could see his blue screen. Put that away. He blames Philip for all his problems, to which he agrees. We leave the room right away and try to get to the docks, but two hitmen stop us. They shoot us if we go the wrong direction, so it's trial and error to figure out the right path. 
We get locked into a room. Trapped. There must be a way out of here. A mirror. I must see if the face I wear is my own. Hurry! Follow me! We follow her to a safe area looking out to the ocean and chat with her a bit. Her name is Sarah and she's looking for her missing niece. Then the hand comes out of nowhere. Sarah's frightened, but there's nothing to worry about. It's a cute, friendly talking severed hand. If we wait, it'll eventually leave. Once it does, Sarah says she thinks Dr. Frankenstein will help her, but we know that's far from the truth. Philip is ashamed of his voice, so instead of telling her we take her to the mausoleum to show her the truth. The game could have automatically taken us there, but we have to go ourselves. Oh well, it's not too far. It doesn't really tell her much, so she leaves to find the doctor. We catch up to her, but then an earthquake occurs, fucking every door but one. And here lurks a monster which we must escape. But really it boils down to pick the right sequence of ladders, or die. So just some more padding. At least it's not a maze. Kind of. It's a little better since it's following up on the foreshadowing by the doctor early in the game. I just hope, Philip, that you turn out better than the last experiment. The flesh grew so uncontrollably thick and twisted like pork butt. You look confused. Actually, you look dazed, but dazed is good. It's still early for you, Philip. Once out, we check the docks to find a new note, revealing Vladimir is smuggling children out of the castle, possibly including Gabrielle. There's also a bomb, just to increase the stakes, you know. I must find Dr. Frankenstein. We find the doctor in the observatory, where he reveals he already knows Sarah. She tries to tell him about the children, but he doesn't believe her. In fact, he placed the bomb to kill Judge Rothenberg, who is working with Vladimir. He leaves locking us in the room, but with some puzzle solving, we could get Sarah out to open the door. Turns out there was a trap gun that set off when she opened the door, but the severed hand saved her. Poor little hand, it never hurt anyone. We rush to the docks, but as we are going, there is an... We get to the docks, but it's too late. Gabrielle is dead. Oh, Gabrielle, dead. Wait a minute, the crystal. I could bring her back to life. We could be together again. Oh, but how could I even think of such a thing? It doesn't show anyone else hit by the bomb, but it's for the best. I'd rather not see that. I think she's dead. I think we could tell, but thanks for the confirmation, I guess. We take her up to the lab and perform the experiment, which is a little tricky to get right. You can actually fail it and get an ending where Gabrielle stays dead and you stay trapped in the castle forever. But we do it correctly and she comes back to life. Daddy, we're alive. I love you. The end. In the ending slideshow, we learn that Philip escapes and lives a happy life with his daughter. Sarah finds her niece unconscious somewhere else and tries to expose the villains, but no one believes her. The kidnappers survived and continue to do evil things. And for Dr. Frankenstein, that's another story. The end. I guess all the kids that died from the bomb stayed dead and didn't get revived because reasons? So with that remark about Dr. Frankenstein, they ended on a cliffhanger. One I'm pretty sure was never followed up on. There was a kinda sequel with Mummy, Tomb of the Pharaoh, but from what I've seen it has no plot connections to this game. It didn't even need the cliffhanger, since the story wraps up completely. I also thought it could have meant to lead into the original novel, but that wouldn't make any sense in this game's plot, so who knows. Overall, 
What holds Frankenstein through the eyes of the monster back is its pacing. There's so much padding, whether through the puzzles, mazes, or repetition of plot points. Each time a maze comes up, there is no point in them at all. They don't serve the plot, the tone, or any gameplay. They only get you lost a bit, make you solve some filler puzzles, and waste time. The only instance being lost served a purpose was in the early game, when the player is first exploring the castle, finding rooms, hidden passageways, and the occasional appearance of the doctor. Here it works since you're just feeling your way around the castle, and when you get lost, you'll probably find another important room. The doctor's random appearances or yelling throughout the castle keeps the intrigue going and helps sell that he's a bad guy. By the time we get to the mines, the puzzles become too drawn out, where you must rely on the notes in order to operate the machinery, but it's still difficult. Not to mention the notes are just difficult to read, but as I said before, could be since I can't read cursive well. I really wish it had an option to just turn it into plain text. It would have made reading much faster and enjoyable. As for the plot itself, it works. I just think a lot of things weren't went into as much as they could have been. Almost every plot reveals through the notes, and outside of some comments by Philip, it leads to a dry story. Every character is essentially on their own, since they rarely communicate directly, so they're kind of standalone if that makes sense. While Tim Curry hems it up very nicely, he doesn't really get to bounce that off anyone. Sarah isn't really around until the end, and her purpose seems mainly to pat out the plot with having to convince her the doctor is bad and everything. They don't even give her plot arc screen time when she finds her niece, so it seems like the game didn't really care about her. The only one that gets to react instead of just act is Philip, and it makes him a more enjoyable character, at least comedy-wise. He is so angsty and melodramatic that it could probably annoy some players, but for me, it helped give the game some more personality. There is also a repetition of plot points that reveals an interesting consequence of not having Philip talk much. Since he rarely talks to anyone, it leads to them giving him plot information that he already knows. It could feel like a mistake or padding, but makes sense in the context of the game's plot. Which in this view, gives Sarah as a character some purpose, albeit not a nice one. I know I made the joke about thanks for clarifying Gabrielle is dead, but it reveals a lot about how she sees Philip, mainly that she doesn't. She sees him as an object of pity, something lesser than. We could see this again and again in her constant refusals to listen to what Philip has to say, and I don't mean audibly. Philip is constantly communicating with her in other ways, which is why I thought it's impressive that the game actually understands that and asks the player to take part in it. It's why I wasn't that harsh on having to backtrack with her to the mausoleum, since it asks the player to act in a way that Philip is comfortable with, humanizing him to us. This is especially important when every major character dehumanizes him in some way. From Judge Rothenberg who framed him for murder so he could sell his body, to the doctor who imprisons him and treats him like a possession to torture, to Sarah who frequently ignores him, they all serve to show how Philip's agency and thus humanity are taken away from him in various forms. His goal of escaping the castle with his daughter is regaining what was stolen from him, his humanity and autonomy. He is no longer controlled by anyone but himself, a good message to send through Frankenstein's story. Now that's all well and good, but there's definitely some criticism to be held against it. Like how most of the female characters are treated as objects as much, if not more than Philip. His wife and daughter being the most apparent examples of this. His daughter is literally a goal throughout the entire game, and has no character outside of one. I love you. I mean Philip's love for her is even surface level, going no deeper than I love her. We have no context for the relationship, especially when Philip seems to hint that he wasn't that good of a father or a husband. His wife is even less of a character. She doesn't even have lines, unless that brain was hers, or even really get talked about. Only use it as an object to be fought over between Philip and the doctor in the notes. Paired with how the game could be seen as negatively looking on Sarah, the game doesn't seem to respect its female characters. Not saying that they had to be perfect, but it's telling that while the game is willing to say Philip deserves to be treated as a human being, they don't get the same treatment. All in all, Frankenstein Through the Eyes of the Monster gives an interesting spin on the Frankenstein tale, which could have been much better if it stopped artificially lengthening itself and extended its lessons to other characters. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please consider supporting me on Patreon or Coffee. Patreon is if you want to support me monthly, and Coffee is for one-time support. 
These videos wouldn't be possible without the generous support of my patrons and coffees. Any amount helps this channel keep going. Anyways, here's my Twitter, my Instagram, my channel link if you want to subscribe, and some other videos I made. Well, that's all I had to say, so thanks again for watching.